It's a sad fact, but the people behind the Iron Curtain never really set their sights too high. Oh! That's a toy lad, eh? Da, da, class da, da. Oh, to be a orchard, Paviezlo. Na takia machine za pis na desiat, yet the pierrot. Kakia de fiori, coliosa. Oh, nasty ashi plastic. Hey, tu vui takoi machine orchard, bravitsa de vushka, eh? Yeah, yeah. Da, da. So just moya machine, velorex, spoiler kopieki. Yeah, yeah. Ya yo y Quentin Wilson of it. Gazmadi, también la haga. Technology mil. That is a sort of conversation you would have heard quite often in the bad old communist times, because believe it or not, there were cars out there worse than the Lada. Well, I'm sorry, but this really is pretty bad ski. The body is vinyl stretched over a metal frame, but it's so flimsy it feels like you're driving around in a wet backpacker. If it's a choice between driving this and working down the salt mines, then give me that pickaxe, because the very least a car should do is go and stop, and this doesn't want to do either. You don't so much press the brakes as write a letter to them asking them if they wouldn't mind stopping the car sometime this week. Karl Marx gave us communism. Well, I wouldn't mind giving him a lift in this and saying, you got any more bright ideas, mate? What's more shocking than the atrociousness of this car is the fact that it's owned by an Englishman living in England. And he's not alone. For years, these good folk have been diving into the Eastern Bloc and laying down good money for some of the most hopeless vehicles of all time. In fact, so fond are they of commie cars, they formed a club, the USSR, the Unloved Soviet Socialist Register. The club's got about 100 members and we've got every kind of Eastern Bloc car from the weird to the wonderful to the fairly boring. I think we're all quite honest about the fact that they may not be termed classic cars insofar as, you know, they don't, some of them don't look particularly attractive. They're agricultural in their engineering, but that's one of the joys in that the Trabi has only got seven moving parts. Therefore, not much is going to go wrong. Well, one of them isn't the wheels. Is Precisely. It? <laughs> it's not a big club, and never will be. But I wouldn't want it to be a big club, because then we'd start the MG problem and become boring farts. Right. And when those lovely MG chaps come a-calling, Julian's best chance of a getaway will be in this huge 5.5-litre V8 Chica. The Chaika was the perfect example of Russian communism in action. That is, all men are created equal. It's just that some have infinitely better clothes and houses and cars. During its 20-year life, only 2,000 Chaikas were built. And when it came to styling, the communists were more conservative than Norman Tebbit. This model looks straight out of the 50s, but in fact, it was made in 1976. While the party boss sat in the back sipping a Molotov cocktail, it was left to the poor old chauffeur up the front to deal with all the aggro. I mean, for a start, you had to be a shot putter to steer it. It does have power steering. I'm just not sure where it is or what it's doing. The stereo comes complete with its own missile launchers, and you've got enough channels to get radio labor camp in Siberia. But even more worrying, the bonnet release says kaput in Russian. It's been accused of being a, a late 50s Packard, but uh, it was in fact all designed and made in-house in Russia, although the design team did uh, apparently buy a, a couple of Packards and a Chrysler for study. I wouldn't, wouldn't possibly copy it, of course. But... Yeah, why would they do that? Because goddamn Americans, you know, they were the enemy, they were the missile pointers. Why would they want to copy? So I suppose point? it's the glamour. The glamour, really. Relatively. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, it's 
like nothing else that you ever see on the road here. I, I don't go out and see myself coming the other way, which is nice. Um, it drives extremely well. Uh, you get it on a motorway and it, it wafts along. Marvellous. Which is great until something breaks. And then you don't really like, go to Halfords and get a bit for it. You've right. got to contact your friends in Latvia and so on. Or even easier, call your friend in Surrey, the comrade mechanic who specialises in keeping Lenin's limos on the road. We have to get piston rings that are different sizes and grind them down to fit pistons that have to have the balls sleeved. The tyres you can get at the moment. Um, bearings you can sort of copy with metric equivalents, hopefully, but on the Volga here you can't get any bearings for that. So you just have to literally modify machine and skim and design and keep them running. This Volga of yours, it's a pretty fancy capitalist colour, isn't it? It's because they painted it that colour so it didn't get vandalised when it was left at Riga docks. Because a Volga like this would have been used basically by the KGB or the special police group. So that would have been black originally. And if people in Latvia had seen that by the docks in black, it would probably have come back in pieces. Because if a black Volga turns up at your house unannounced, it's time to start packing your thermals it's for time Siberia. time to go out the yeah. back entrance, yeah. Have you got respect for the Russians and their car making? Yeah, I have in actual fact, because the vehicles were built to take very hard road conditions, very severe winters, and they had to be driven by people who hadn't got any mechanical knowledge at all, because they weren't given mechanical knowledge. If your car breaks down, there's no garage, there is nobody to help. You either get it going or you'll freeze. I really like this club because they're so tongue-in-cheek. But the trouble is, now that communism's dead, the Russians are going through their vulgar nouveau riche stage. So, what kind of cars are they going to be collecting in ten years' time? I fear for the worst. <laughs>